Hey, welcome to Questions, Coffee, and Cars, episode number three. Mm -hmm. If you're a regular viewer of our full-length reviews, we stop halfway through and do Questions, Coffee, and Cars. Yeah. We've decided to do a standalone version. So when Andrea puts her post on Instagram, you ask the questions there. What's the address, Andrea? It's motormouth underscore Andrea, and I only leave that post up for 24 hours. We gather all the questions, and then the post is deleted. Now, some of you may not be on Instagram, and that's okay. Just enjoy the questions, and Zach also does a live show so you can always send in a question to him yep. when he does it every Sunday. Every Sunday. All right. So what question is coming up that we thought was interesting? Ooh, JD Power versus Consumer Reports. All right. We'll get into that Stick one right around. now. Let's get into the questions. Time now for questions, coffee, and cars. Your questions from Instagram. What do you think of the reality that most people are now having to purchase vehicles without test driving them or even seeing them in person? I've had dealerships tell me that the days of packed car lots are gone and that they will pivot to build orders only. Good question. I got to say, our reviews have become more and more important to people. At least that's what our viewers are saying because they can't test drive them. I would hope that dealers would have their mainline cars. So if you go into a Honda dealer, you would hope they'd have a Civic and Accord and a CRV there to drive. But they don't. But some of them don't. No. So just try another dealer. Uh, the problem we have moving forward is if there's a slowdown in the economy and everybody's predicting that all the economists are uh, say next year, um, yes, the car companies want to limit the inventory because it keeps the prices up. Yeah. But all you need is one brand to fill the lots so you could go down on a Saturday, pick the color and the trim you want and drive it home that afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if one brand starts to do that, they'll have success. Yeah, and we're not going to have this inventory shortage forever. We all know that. But Zach, that's what I always say as well, that if all brands stick to doing the same thing and they only have limited inventory on the lots, then that's how it's going to stay. But the minute they change their mind, mm -hmm. everyone's going to be fighting for the sale. So we wait and see what happens. I think we're in this for quite some time still. I'm considering my first electric vehicle. I know there's major issues with the Chevy Bolt. I've seen various issues with the batteries, braking, and connectivity issues. I've certainly watched your review. You seem very happy with it. Am I foolish for considering a 2023? Anything new or updated for this version? Nothing new for 2023 with the Chevy Bolt except for the price decrease in decrease. the U.S. Wait, 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 did you hear that right? Mm -hmm. A price decrease. When have we ever heard of that? Now, this isn't insignificant either. They dropped no. the price to what? $5,900 uh, decrease only for the U.S. Canada is still the same. And one of the reasons why they did that is to make it more competitive because the tax credit is no longer available in the U.S. Of course, in Canada, the federal rebate is still available of $5,000 and then any provincial rebates available in participating provinces. Yeah, it's a screaming deal, mm -hmm. $25,000. So you're referring to a, a, a history of problems with the Bolt mm -hmm. going back several years. So they changed the car last year, 2022. That's why there's no changes for 2023. And they made it a much better vehicle, much better infotainment system, mm -hmm. uh, great drive. Comfortable seats. Comfort yeah, the seats were uh, vastly improved. Yeah. They upgraded the interior which is what it needed, gave it a new look on the outside, but the battery and all of that has been upgraded now after the recall that they had. I am a huge fan of the Chevy Bolt. I think it is the real screaming deal in the EV space. I know. And if I was looking for a city runaround hatchback, that's the one I'd buy. You know, Zach and I were talking about this last night and the EV has 417 kilometers of range and then the EUV has just under 400 kilometers so this is really good I mean I could handle that well, no that, problem yeah so that's just uh, for our US viewers that's about 250 miles so yeah. it's a really incredible value and then I've got some pricing here as well the starting price is just over thirty eight and a half thousand dollars in Canada and just over twenty five and a half thousand in the US isn't that amazing and then the EUV is just over forty thousand dollars in Canada and just over twenty seven thousand dollars in the US. Now one of what the differences steal. before we move on uh, the U.S. has a cheaper model. I think it's the 1LT. In Canada, they only sell the 2LT, the mm -hmm. higher trim spec and therefore that's uh, is an even better deal. 
to the best car reviewers on YouTube. How nice is that? Thank you. I spat out my coffee. Thank I you. I am looking for an all-luxury hybrid SUV with all-wheel drive. As a result, looking at the 2023 Lexus UX 250H. Have you had a chance to look at the most recent model with some small tweaks? Curious on your opinion. So you're obviously looking at a small, I wouldn't even call it an SUV crossover hatchback kind of vehicle. Uh, when you drive it, it's quite impressive and fun. And there are some changes for 2023, right? Yeah, and I just want to point out, if you're looking for a spacious second row, you're not going to find it in the UX. And, Although, the, cargo, and the cargo space yeah. is limited and the floor is high. But it, I think it's really a, a couple's car, right? Yeah, but we do have a follower who bought the UX and she has put two car seats in the rear and they do fit. But if well, you, you fit got... anybody in there, Andrea, it's how comfortable it is. <laughs> but if you've got tall kids and they're back there all the time, you may not love it or they mm -hmm. may not love it. But um, if you're not using the back seat a lot, wow, I really like the UX a lot. But what was clumsy about it, I kind of thought it was quirky and fun, was the controller mm -hmm. for the infotainment and uh, you know phone and all that. But that's what's changed, right? Well, I would totally get the 2023 model, not the previous model because Lexus has updated the infotainment system so now you get wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto an available 12.3 inch touchscreen and the trackpad is gone which is wonderful they've also made improvements to the suspension and chassis as well so that's the model to get if you're interested for a family with two six-foot teens starting to drive, which EV can comfortably handle their length in the back and also easy for them to maneuver? One wants us to get a new Mini Cooper SE, but that seems so impractical. Well, to play off the last question, you should get a Lexus. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff them in the back of that. No, it's not a pure EV. No. So they want a Mini Electric? The, one of the boys, I guess. Or I don't know. Are they boys? I'm saying you just if, said teens, so they want a Mini. If they're, are they over six feet? Over six yeah, feet, yeah. I'm guessing yeah. They're, they're boys, yeah. Not necessarily. Well, it could There's be, Andrea. I mean, I'm not. I'm not gonna. You know, I just guessing that yes, they're boys. Guessing. That's, yeah. I was under the assumption too, but it says teens. All right, let's move on. <laughs> so I would say that there's a lot of choices. I think that EVs are quite expensive. So I don't know if this is a family vehicle. I would say that the ID4 is very spacious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's open. It can handle the height of your kids. Uh, Ionic 5, EV6. It's really about budget, though. Yeah, so I think it really comes down to, are you going to be all driving in the vehicle together? Yeah. Mini might not be the best choice if it's them driving on their own as, as say, a second car or occasionally with somebody in the back seat, then uh, Mini would be fine. But, um, but there you go. Is there a reason you reference JD Power and not Consumer Reports? Actually, we get a lot of hassle about the fact that we are always referring to JD Power. One of the reasons why I use it is because the information is free. With Consumer <laughs> Reports, I would have to subscribe and, and I, uh, I just find it easier to access and I don't have to pay anything. I wonder if there's kind of rules around sharing their results because mm -hmm. that's their model, right? Mm -hmm. They want you to pay to be a subscriber to get the results. So if we got the results and then shared them to millions of people, that might not go over well. Yeah, it might not. Yeah, so that's one reason why we yeah. don't do it. But but could you want to get into the methodology? Yeah, let's uh, get into it. Okay, so Consumer Reports is a subscription-based model. So if you, in the old days, used to get the magazine to find out which is the best dishwasher, um, you know, washer, dryer, all that sort of stuff. And so people that, that subscribe to that now do it with an online format and they give information about the cars that they've bought. Yeah. So the problem I have with this is it is skewed. So people who are subscribers to Consumer Reports and want to find out what the best vacuum dishwasher and washing machine are probably tend to be a little bit more conservative mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're more careful with their purchases and it might be the same for their cars. So you would see often um, Lexus, Toyota, now they do make good cars, but sort of more conservative cars yeah. scored much better. Yeah, and the thing about JD Power is that for three years they follow people who own these vehicles that they're researching and they choose the third month and the third year and everything in between. So if there is a problem with the vehicle, these people are going to report it. Now, I also hear from some viewers... Okay, just before you jump onto yeah. that, about the pricing thing, right? Yeah. Okay, the one thing is that um, 
it's totally anonymous. So they just uh, they just send letters out to people. They've got the information and say, will you take part in this? So they don't know who they are. That's what's different with consumer reports. Yeah. These are people who are typically uh, older and more male and the cons more conservative is my opinion is what they're buying. And then the other thing is that consumer reports then puts their own twist on the results. Mm -hmm. They have people like us who put their own result information in there. For so sure. th what's the problem with JD Power we always get? So we always hear that oh well JD Power um, charges for their uh, information to manufacturers true manufacturers will buy the data but the research is done by JD Power by and and they're getting information from real people now I also hear from viewers who say yeah but JD Power touches on everything and excuse the results and I ask well what do you mean by that and they say well if there's a problem with the infotainment system let's say it's glitchy or it freezes or something happens that gets reported and it skews the total results but don't you want to know about these things what they're looking at is trips back to the dealer it could be anything it could Anything. be the transmission falls out on the highway. Yeah. It could be that your Bluetooth doesn't work. They're equally uh, important and have to get resolved at the dealer. So that's what they track with these things. Yeah. So here's the information I got from Dave Sargent in many radio interviews with him over the years. He says what we get as consumers and what we report to you is just the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. of the information that they collect. So what they're doing is they're kind of doing all the data collection and all the information pro bono. Yeah. So they do that without getting getting paid and then if you want to read it uh, hello for General Motors Chrysler by the way he told me every brand every brand pays for their information um, then they then they let them look at it so they're, they're doing it backwards mm -hmm. and then people say oh well um, they pay like General Motors pays to get a good result well what, no. do, you, what do you say to, to Land Rover and Jaguar then you should yeah. pay up yeah doesn't work that way. So in the end, this is what I say. If you're looking for a certain vehicle and you are serious about purchasing it and you want to get as much information as you want, look at JD Power look at and look yeah. at Consumer Reports and find out what each of them are saying. We use JD Power because we don't want to subscribe to oh, We can, to can get access to reports. the information, right? Yeah. But one, one more thing before we go, because I could go on for this for half an hour. Um, JD Power, then they license their award to the manufacturer to use in advertising. Mm -hmm. So you say the Toyota Prius is the best car in the world, apparently just using this as an example, according to JD Power. Well, they pay for those rights. That's all they're doing. They're not paying to get the award. It's the other way around. Yeah. Your pick for a retired couple touring car. New RX350, MDX, QX60. I've eliminated most other competitors for reliability or depreciation concerns. I dug into this a little bit more. They actually don't need the third row. I thought maybe they were grandkids or kids, but there aren't any. So it's just strictly um, these three that they like. It's kind yeah. of overkill, isn't it? Well, like you, we were talking about this as well. Like some people just like a big vehicle. Yeah, some people just like the space. Yeah, I would say for me, I would just go with the RX. I think it's a great vehicle and the technology is excellent in it. Yeah, so you're obviously picking Japanese uh, yeah. made vehicles. Um, the new QX is very well done. They did a good job on it. The MDX, we love the way it drives, mm -hmm. except we don't like the track pad and all that piano black on the inside. I would land on the RX as well. I think it doesn't have the third row. It sounds like you don't need it. No. So um, uh, that's a winner. You might want to try, and you might want to go down two categories <laughs> from three row to RX. Try the NX. It's mm -hmm. really good. NX is really great as well. Zach and Andrea, probably the most puzzling question of this century. Mm. Why do car manufacturers keep using cheap gloss black plastic and market it as premium? It's called marketing. That's mm -hmm. what they do. Piano black, as I've started calling it, is shiny hard plastic. We're seeing it more and more. You're it's right. Terrible. In the luxury brands, for sure. We see it in Porsche. Uh, BMW in here? uses a little bit. A little bit of yeah, it. this is an older vehicle and it's got it's piano tiny, black. It's tiny, tiny yeah. bit. I mean, and then you see it in the non luxury brands. You know, I was reading this article and, and somebody tried to justify it saying that humans like shiny things and that we're drawn to shiny it's things. It's like a fish to a lure. Is, yeah, is that why? Like, it, was it a marketing thing that they said, oh, these humans are going to come in the vehicle and it's going to be shiny and they're going to love it? They well, look, we don't. They look great new. Mm hmm. 
-hmm. They look great clean. They look good in photos and it presents well. It looks luxurious, yeah. um, but it's just shiny hard plastic. Uh, I think it's fine to have a little strip here and there like this, but when the whole, like speaking of the MDX in the previous question, Ooh, yeah. where the whole center console is the shiny hard stuff, it's it's got to go. It's tough because it's just so dusty. It's everywhere. Fingerprints. It's hard to keep clean. If you were in the market for a new SUV hybrid or EV, 50,000 US, what would your choice Sorry, be? Say that again slowly. Uh, if you were in, in the, the market, market for a hybrid, hybrid or an EV, EV. 50,000 US, what would you choose? You go first. I would, it would be for me, it would be to, between the ID4 and the Ionic 5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any hybrid you could pretty much pick because yeah. they're, they're falling Speaking under. Of the NX would be a good choice, right? Yeah, the NX hybrid would, I think it's yeah, just over 50,000, right? the mm -hmm. NX hybrid. So let's just say that any non luxury hybrid, you're golden here. You could even get away with some plug in hybrids as well, depending on the trim you choose. Um, I would pick. Probably, I looked up the Genesis GV60 because that's my favorite right now. Unfortunately, it's over 50 US. So I would go EV6 because I think that is the best looking. I don't like the look of it. Um, that's why I went but, Ionic. Yes, but check the rear headroom if you decide because it does have a slope and it might not work for everybody. And then I think I'd go with the ID4. ID4 mm -hmm. right now in the SUV space is the best value. Is it the best one? I'm not sure, but it's the best value. Mm. Do you make your own coffee? Coffee or are you sponsored by a coffee shop? Well, we are looking for a sponsor for Questions Coffee. I guys. won't show you the logo because they're not paying for it. But no. yes, I told you last time we have the coffee cup. No, we don't make our own coffee. No, we don't make we're, our own. We're addicted, as you know. We have a yeah. segment called Questions Coffee and Cars. Mm -hmm. But we have a big drip coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. Which, then, yeah. then we have this when we go out. And then mm -hmm. often in the afternoon, we'll have another one. I know. Isn't it terrible? But I think if you're going to be addicted to something, I think coffee is probably okay. I'm addicted to you, Anne. Oh, I dicked it. Do you love. think? Do you, do Might you, as well face it. I'm addicted. To do you love. think it's realistic for states like California and New York to mandate electric cars to be the only ones on the market by 2035? No, I don't. I don't really think that. Um, that's fair unless EVs come down in price because they are not affordable to everyone. Good news is this. You can continue to drive your gas model at that time. You just can't purchase a new gas model. So yeah, you know what's going to happen is somebody who lives in New York will just drive over into New Jersey and buy a car. Yeah, you could do that. And somebody's going to go from California to Nevada and buy a car. Mm -hmm. So that might happen. But yes, Right now, if, if the trend continues the way it is, there are no, General Motors is saying they're going to have EVs for everyone. We'll see if they can do it because mm -hmm. right now it's tough to get a deal on anything other than Bolt. Yeah. How many kilometers do you get on average on your diesel Porsche Cayenne with city driving? With the cost of diesel, especially in a city like Vancouver, where fuel cost per liter on average is above the national average cost. Oh boy, is it ever above. We do really well here in the city. We get about, uh, well, over 750 kilometers to every fill. So um, it's about 10 liters in the city. Mm -hmm. If you take it on a highway run, it goes down to about six and a half or seven. And then the funny, this is an interesting thing with this uh, car. This is what we're sitting in. So we did a trip down to Seattle, went to see the Blue Jays play down there. Mm -hmm. And my, our neighbor was in the passenger seat. I said, watch this. We will leave Vancouver and we'll have more mileage mm -hmm. by the time we get to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So we started at 700 kilometers. By the time we got to after, after driving for two hours, we had a thousand kilometers. Isn't that range. amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Highway. It just shines on the highway. And you know what? Diesel should really be driven on the highway. It loves it. <laughs> it's but what do we do? We're always in the city. Here's the thing I always say about fuel fluctuations. You have to look at the cost of ownership over the entire span of the vehicle. In our case, even in Vancouver, in the four plus years we've owned this car, there has only been about three or four months, I would say six months now, where diesel was more expensive than yeah. regular. Uh, and then you then you have to compare it to premium because if you had the gas version of this, it would take premium gas. So the overall cost of ownership of this is still cheaper, mm -hmm. even with the spike in prices right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really like this vehicle. It's a not lot. going anywhere. No, we're keeping it. And this car's name is Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper's going nowhere. No. I have ordered a Toyota BZ4X or BZ4X LE. And with the issues around wait times for the vehicle and recalls, 
due to tires falling off, should I take back my order? I see Volkswagen ID4s and Hyundai Ionic 5s already on the road with owners enjoying the product. I'm ready for an electric vehicle, but is the BZ4X worth waiting for? Toyota reliability is what I want. Okay, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Tell us the thing, Andrea. I want to know the thing. I just don't know if I could wait up to two years for a vehicle. I think in a year I would change my mind with so many new vehicles coming to the market. I would be like, uh, I don't think I want this anymore. Like I said at the beginning, if there's a marked slowdown in the economy, lots will start to fill up. All those people that have their names on plug-in hybrids and all that, they're going to get the call from the dealer and go, hey, Bob, Steve, Larry, Sally, yeah. whatever your name is, hey, your car's coming next month. You want it? And they look at their finances and go, oh, geez, not a time to buy a car. Give it to <laughs> someone else. Yeah. That I think is going to happen. If we do have a marked turn down in the economy, back to the Toyota, no wheels fell off of no. the Toyota. We were told this quite <laughs> vigorously when we were in Toyota's company. Uh, not a wheel fell off. Not so what, a wheel. So the front um, hubs, and there was some defect in the way it was engineered, when all that torque would go through, there would be a twist and something happened with the wheel hubs, no wheels fell off. I would happily recommend the car if you could get one. Production, I read last week, has started up again, mm -hmm. so there you go. And most of those recalls were on European models that were sold. They hadn't actually sold a lot in North America yet. But they'd only sold 3,500 periods, so yeah, that's a it was, tiny it amount. Was a tiny amount. Um, I would say, I agree with Zach, I think the BZ4X is a great vehicle. It's really up to you how long you want to wait for something. But you know what? They're all the same. I mean, it's difficult to get an EV6, Except an Ionic 5, and an ID4 right now. The only one you can get quickly is a Tesla. What cars do you think Canada misses out on? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start this and then mm -hmm. you say yours. Um, first off, we don't get the RS3 in Canada. Oh, yeah, that's which a shame. Would be, it would be so great to have that one. You, the U.S. does get it. And then the other thing that, that I kind of miss is the Mazda CX-60 plug-in hybrid. We don't get that in North America. And then there's a lot of Volkswagens that we don't oh, get. Yeah. Hybrids and plug-in hybrids and even the ID3. So it would be nice to have some of those. I think those are the ones that are kind of top of mind for me that we're missing. So for me, it's just, I would, I would just cherry pick each company. Like there are some Peugeots I think look really cool. Mm -hmm. Some Renaults I like. Um, some European brands we don't get. I wish we got some uh, cars like a Skoda, Volkswagen versions. They don't sell outside of mm -hmm. Europe. I mean, there's some, if you cherry picked, the one I would love, Andrea, it's good. <laughs> it's the Volkswagen Passat wagon. Yeah. They would sell six of them, but I'd, I'd be one of them. You know what I'd like? The Touareg. I always liked yeah. that one. Wasn't yeah. that a good one? It was well. We're sitting oh, in the cousin of the I Touareg. Know. This is the Cayenne. Okay, they... we're just going to do one no, more. No, no, I'm gonna no. We're, we're going to sneak it through. I'm going to sneak it through. You haven't fallen just, asleep yet, have you? Just one more. Just one and more. They're on the sofa watching okay. this, Andrea, and they're like, oh, is this over? Okay, we'll do it really fast. Okay. Would you buy the RAV4 Hybrid Limited or the Venza Limited? Do you think it's worth the difference in price? Yes, and I'll tell you why, because the Venza is quieter. It does feel more luxurious in this inside. And the price difference, I have my notes. I'm going to look at the price difference between these two. So the RAV4 Hybrid is 44,650 Canadian, 38,530 in the US, versus the Venza, $48,500 Canadian, and just over $40,500 in the US. Not a massive difference, like a couple thousand in the US. Venza, all the way. Toyota RAV4 for me. And that's it. I well, hope <laughs> you enjoyed our questions, coffee and cars standalone segment. I really like this a lot. I think we're just going to keep doing it. So if you want to get a question in, you really have to follow Andrea at Instagram. It's motormouth underscore Andrea. And yep. I'll pump the brakes before you start typing. I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> if you don't like that idea, I do a live show yeah. um, every Sunday. You can get in on that right here on the tube. And yeah. uh, when will we see them next? Well, oh. we'll see them soon. I guess. Yeah, we'll see you next week.